Hey, my name is Rory Canterbury. I'm going to be hosting Arch Talk 101, and we have Jeff on the line with us, and we're going to hear some really exciting stories from him today. So welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you, Roy. I appreciate it, man. Tell us a little something about yourself so we get, get to kind of know you a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my background is, uh, is relatively diverse. Uh, most of it really does uh, encompass... Uh, the fishing world, but I've got uh, a, a lot of history in the in the hunting side of things. Not only my own personal stuff, but uh, working between uh, archery shops and uh, and having the chance to do some television uh, in the archery world as well, and uh, having a lot of fun there. But currently, uh, my job is the uh, I'm the tournament director for the Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's National Walleye Tour and the uh, Masters Walleye Circuit as well as the Sturgeon Bay Open Bass Tournament and a number of other events throughout uh, throughout the upper uh, Midwest region. Keeps you busy during the summer doing a lot of fishing, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, from <laughs> basically March through October, or at least a part of October, I'm um, busy uh, quite a bit on the road. And and uh, now from uh, that mid-October point through uh, December, I really concentrate a lot about uh, on uh, doing some hunting. That's the nice thing about being an outdoors. You can you can either fish or hunt every day of the year. Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there's, it's there's uh, something to fish or hunt. That's right. And and it's fun to be connected in the world too. Yeah, it is. So how did how did you get started in archery? Well, really, archery came about uh over the, uh, over closer to my adulthood. Uh, and 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 it's a shame because when I was growing up, my dad uh, took a lot of time off uh, to uh, off of uh, hunting and, and archery and stuff like that to raise my my brother and I. And uh, to back that up a little bit, it was sad that he had to do that because he and and his dad, my grandfather, actually uh, had an archery shop uh, uh, right up to about the time I was born. And then uh, you know the world kind of falls apart when you have kids. You don't know yeah. you know which way is which way is up and, and how much time you have for everything. But uh, my grandfather and my grandmother actually ran an archery shop for a very long time and uh, it, all out of their home. And then uh, my dad picked it up, of course, uh, shot instinctually uh, through uh, long bows and then into recurves. And, um, and I had a harder time picking it up. I, I shoot left-handed. I, I am left-handed. I shoot left-handed. And, uh, at the time when I was, you know, we're talking um, late 80s, early 90s, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, youth model left-handed bows, especially in that, um, uh, you know, modern technology realm. Uh, right. I did a little bit of uh, instinctual shooting with some long bows, uh, but I, I didn't get into it a whole lot. And because my dad took time off to raise kids, I wasn't really brought into that archery hunting world at a really young age. I kind of had to pick it up on my own as I, a, a, into adulthood. Um, and I found some, some great friends that were great mentors. And of course I could rely on my dad. My grandpa had some stuff sitting around that I was able to talk to him with and, uh, and kind of explore and, and learn a little bit of history of things. Uh, but uh, I picked it up as, as I got into adulthood. And started with some older used equipment, left-hand equipment that was, you know, kind of lying around in people's basements and things like that. And really got to learn what, uh, what the development kind of from that, uh, that uh, recurve technology from the early 90s. And then I progressed kind of along with it um, as I was able to afford better, better options. And um and it was in, uh, in 2017, uh, I had shot a number of different bows through that time period. Uh, uh, we had Brownings, we were, uh, we were hunting with bears, we were hunting with, and then uh, got into uh, Forge, which is a, was a bow company out of uh, southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, uh, hunted with a few of those, shot those for a while. And in 2017, um, one day I was out shooting bow at my, at my house and shot probably 35, 40 arrows or so that day, went to draw back at one point and the string let loose. 
uh, what ended up happening is uh, at some point, a small pebble got uh, uh, wrapped in the wax on the cam and sat there running back and forth inside the oh. cam. So it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a place that I could, you know, really visually see well, unless I was looking for something specific like that. And actually cut through enough of the string bands to to release on uh, at one point. I punched myself in the face. My shoulder <laughs> dislocated. Uh, it was uh, it was quite the scene. And uh, and since then, it's been a matter of trying to 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 build back. It, it really uh, I've had some shoulder issues even before that, but building that back and um, you know getting to use uh, the use of a crossbow for a while and things like that has been helpful to at least be able to get out and and hunt. Uh, but building that back and now my son is is uh interested in archery and, and he's 10 um and probably the uh the the largest challenge is getting he's a real small framed 10 year old is finding a bow that's comfortable for him weight wise uh posture wise that uh, that he really would have the ability to build into um to do some hunting at some point, if, if he would like here in his, in his early, uh, youth, uh, seasons is, um, a lot of the youth bows that you can use at, you know, five to whatever pounds uh, what I've noticed is that they, they're not as balanced. They're not, uh, as lightweight as they, you know, probably could be, of course, you know, you're, you're, you're building something for maybe, somebody who doesn't use it for very long before maybe stepping up. Uh, but that's the, one of the challenges that I've noticed in, in that kind of getting him started in that youth side of things is you can get the really cheap ones and get the, uh, you know, the, the, the Walmart uh, stuff off the shelf and uh, Genesis makes a nice bow for just doing some target shooting. But, uh, but once you get into that uh, realm of hunting, it, it's a little bit more difficult to find. Yeah, that, that's always the challenge when you have somebody that can't draw a lot of weight, um, getting a bow that fits them that they can actually shoot and grow with. And, you know, now there's there's several different options you have that, that'll grow with them, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where, where the kids can shoot them and adults can shoot them. It's just, you know, you can set the draw length and draw weight goes up because the length goes up. Sure. Where you have yeah. challenges when you have an adult that can't pull much weight. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, going through, obviously when, when, when the bow, uh, blew up, I, I mean, I lost parts and pieces and all kinds of things. Uh, and, and searching for a bow that was comfortable at that, that lightweight, um, that was accurate enough, you know, you want some speed, you want some accuracy, but when you've got those bows turned down, you, you typically don't see quite the accuracy that you want to see until you can get them turned up uh to their to their peak yeah they do perform a little bit better when they're up a little bit closer to to their peak weight um mm -hmm. you know having a bow blow up on you is is no fun i actually had one do that it, it wasn't the string breaking it was the bow breaking in half yeah it, it was the old magnesium risers it was a american challenger um, high country bottom out but uh you know i'm i'm shooting and i'm getting ready to for hunting season and i'm shooting and, and i just i just can't get it sighted in every time i shoot and i adjust it i shoot it it's off by more it's off by more and finally i decide i'm going to go close to the backstop so i can see where it's at and i shot and after i shot i'm holding the bottom half of the bow in my hand and the top half comes back and smacks me in the chest <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it, you know and i should have noticed something that day because it was something was odd about shooting that day i, I like i said i shot 35 40 arrows and the reason i was shooting really that much at, and this was beginning of august usually i've, I've pretty established you just shoot around and maybe 10 arrows or so and be fine uh was because something just seemed a little off and uh you know it, it, it didn't matter if it was going to happen either that set of of arrows or or another set that uh a couple of days later it's just an unfortunate thing to have happen yeah, it's it you know it's it's something that we we don't always pay attention to is when something it feels different. Mm -hmm. There's something different. There's something going on, and, and that's something we all need to look at is something don't feel right on the bow. There's something going on. Yeah, um, you know we need to start checking it out. And yeah. you know I I did a podcast earlier, but you know about um you know what do you need to check for go hunt. 
And one of the things that went over is you need to wax the string. You need to rub your hands all the way up and down the string. And, and one thing that makes, you know, the scorpion makes a really good wax, but they put a piece of leather in there. Take that yeah. piece of leather and throw it away. That's the worst thing you can do your string. Because you can take sure. that that leather and rub it up and down. It gets so hot, you can actually burn the strings. Yeah, You can't do yeah. that with your fingers. Get a really good yeah. wax, but get your fingers on the string. And you're going to feel any burrs or anything in there. Um, yeah, you know, and it makes sure you go around, look, look every, look at the cams, make sure they're all right. Look at the strings, look at the, you look at your sight and make sure there's nothing wrong with your sight. I take just yep. cancel everything. You know, I'm going through and I notice, you know, it's, it's like my, my third or fourth pin down to the, the fiber optic had broke off of it. Well, I don't shoot that distance anymore. I'm not going to hunt the, at that kind of a range. Uh, for sure. one, I have trouble seeing that far anymore. So I'm not taking those longer shots. So I'm not going to worry about changing it right now um you know but if it had been the 20 yard pin now then that's a different yeah. story yeah you know yeah. there there you got to try and figure out okay how can i change it make sure you mark where it goes take it out replace it and put it back in and um you, you know but it was i think it was my 50 yard pin <laughs> yeah yeah you know and i noticed uh, uh most often when i was working at the archery shops uh is that we would get some some uh, archers that would inspect their bow when they first, you know, take it out of the the case. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They were looking at it in July and August. Okay. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and they would notice something wrong at that point, but really you need to make mental notes of things throughout the season. I got so many, uh, so many times that either I have, or I've watched friends, uh, lowering bows and it hits the side of their tree stand or or gets wrapped up in in something when you get it down on the ground or something like that those things can make a big difference the next time you take that bow back out you know if you've got a small right. stick that's in between that string and cam and it's there because you know you properly waxed your bow and there's just you know a little bit of, of wax off the side and that's stuck there and that that really can wreak havoc on you the next time and obviously you know you wouldn't want that if you're out hunting but but safety wise, uh, you don't want something to happen. Well, and I use a, a sling when I carry it um, that hooks over both cams and, and it yeah. has a little sling and you get a just fit there and put it over your shoulder. And, and since I started using that, it's like, oh man, why did I ever walk in without one of them? But it sure. doesn't protect your strings and your sight quite so well. Um, yeah. I think it's Primos makes one it actually covers your strings as well. Sure. You know, so now sure. your strings and cables are protected from brush and stuff in there. And then, yep. you know, worry about your site. Well, you could put a cover over your site. Well, yeah. by the time you get all that, why don't you just carry it in your bow, your bow case? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's you know. right. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, you just you need to make that. a habit. Yeah, you need to make a habit just looking at your stuff and 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 making sure you're observant, you know. I mean, that, that, that that's what the name of the game is when you're in the woods hunting is being observant you got to start long before that right and you know and i've seen people wax their string they're just wax caked all over the string that's right. that doesn't do you any good because that's right. just caked on the outside you've yeah. got to put it yeah. on just put a little bit on rub it in your fingers will get it warm enough to melt into the strands yeah. and then you know if you have a bunch of cake stuff on it all you do is waste your wax yeah. you know just yeah. rub it in and I tell people, it's like, every time you go hunt, go ahead and wax your string, but, but either the night before or that morning, uh, throw a little wax on it. Um, not that it has to have wax every time, but you can put right. your fingers on your string every time. Yeah. You know, even if you don't yeah. put wax on it, rub your fingers on it. Just, just kind of feel it. And if you feel any burrs or if you see any broken strands, yeah, that's something yeah. to be concerned about because now your string is degraded, you know, substantially. Yeah, yeah it's compromised. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, and, like and you know, and, and these are precision weapons these days. I mean, you've really got to right. be careful with things. Uh, and if you want it to work properly, you, you need to be checking stuff like that. Yeah, uh, check them out and, and you know, take some shots. What I used to do is, you know, I, well, when I get in a tree stand, I'm going to get my arrow in there and knock it because I never draw back without an arrow, especially sure. use a release. It's too easy to make it accidentally yeah, fire yeah. it, you know. Um, I'll draw it back, you know, and see how it feels. That also makes sure I can draw it back because I had one time I yeah. couldn't, uh, 
you know, I hadn't been practicing throughout the season. It was, you know, like December, cold, and sure. I, I yeah. couldn't draw my ball back because I was still cold and, and it wasn't warmed up. Uh, so draw back, you know, make sure everything is there. You can also, during that time, and draw, take and move around to different positions to see if you, there's anything that's going to be in your way. What's going to hit your upper limb or your lower limb? Sure. Um, you know, I shot sitting down one time and my lower limb caught the tree stand. Yeah. Um, yeah, that deer was, you know, probably 10 yards out and I missed it by five yards. I was yeah. short by five yeah. yards because it caught it, threw it right down. Uh, you know, yep. that's the, I, you gotta I, look threw, at too. I shot through, uh, the side of a blind one time at a deer at oh, yeah. eight, eight yards. And I was like, how did I miss? And kind of went back into the blind and, oh, I see just underneath the Velcro strip of the, you know, of the window. <laughs> yep. It just never, never never put that in my sight picture, you know, when, when I was sitting there. Yeah, and, I, and I know that's a problem because, you know, try shooting a five yard shot. Yeah. You're, you're not going to get it unless you know what you're doing because you're going to have to use probably your 70 yard pin to shoot at five yards. Yeah. Because when people don't realize it is your eyes is the same level as your sight. Your arrow is down from your eyes to your corner of your mouth. That distance there is, oh, what, probably two and a half, three inches. Yeah. It's below where you're seeing. And, yeah. you know, when I'm in a blind, I was like, okay, and I'm, I'm looking at the arrow where the arrow is lined up. I don't care where the sights are. I'm looking for yeah. the arrow because sometimes you got to sit up a little straighter. You know, I'm sometimes you'll scrunch down. And you may need to sit up a little taller and get yeah. in there or even put a cushion on it to get up high enough that you, you don't hit your blind, you know, except yeah. the parts you're supposed to shoot through. Um, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it makes know, a big but, difference. I can tell you that from from absolute experience. It makes a big yeah, difference. Yeah, it's like I I prefer to hunt out of a tree stand anyway. But you get a lot more visibility. But hey, when it's really cold, it's nice being in a blind. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah especially absolutely. in Nebraska. You know, yeah, yeah. In, in Wisconsin, here it's uh it's the same thing. Uh, you know, get a little cold. And the other thing is, is because I'm hunting uh, oftentimes with my son. Uh, you know, he's been coming hunting with me since he was boy, three and a half, four years old. Um, and so, you know, getting, getting a kid that young up into a tree stand safely, quietly <laughs> is, <laughs> is, uh, is a challenge, you know? So we did, we do a lot of blind hunting right now, um, uh, with, with that advantage. So whether I got him set up and the wind is right, I'm going to use it regardless of, of, uh, whether he's with me or not. Yeah. Well, a nice thing, you know, kids that age, they don't sit as still as we can. Well, sometimes we don't sit very still either. No. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. but, you know, it does allow them to move around a little bit and, and not yeah. be, you know, it's like, okay, I can't move. I got to be froze. And, and kids are not going to enjoy that. They want to be able to look around and, and you know, look yeah. at the stuff and, and have them look. And I know when I took my son out with one time, I was like, I give him the deer call. I said, your job is to call. As if they're yep. coming in, fine. You know, if they're not coming in, they're either going to respond to it or not respond to it. Yep. You know, yep. Ab absolutely. They're, I mean, the deer are, I mean, I think we give them a little too much credit. Uh, oftentimes it's more a curiosity that's, that's bringing them in. Um, if you're good at calling at the right time and they're, they're looking to listen for it, well, then, then, then you got it made. But otherwise, you know, Oftentimes we call too much and it works for us because they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. I know I, I had a, a couple of does coming by and, and this is back when we had two tags, all we could get. And, you know, two archer tags, either sex. So the first one, I just shot deer so I could get meat. The second one, I went out bucks until December. So I'm hunting most of the, you know, the November time frame. you know, just waiting for a buck. And, sure. and I heard what, you know, it was, it was a doe bleeding, you know, I thought it's just a duck hunter screwing around with their, their duck call, which sure. I do sometimes when I'm out <laughs> duck hunting and nothing's flying. I'm I just mess around with the duck call. They're like, who cares, yeah. right? Um, and I was like, oh man, that's two does. So I got on the grunt call and I went, <clears throat> you know, I, I I didn't even make a decent call. And the, the doe that was bleeding just kind of kept walking. And the, the bigger doe that was with her come running underneath my tree stand. I think she hit my pole rope. I'm looking through my tree stand at her. And, sure. and it wasn't even a decent grunt. It was, it was just all <laughs> messed up grunt. You, you sure. know, it's like, sure. you, you know, I just, 
it was it, it was a terrible call as far as I but she come right, running right. to see what was going yeah. on. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's curiosity sometimes. Yeah. So I'm looking and it's like, and the hunt partner's like, well, just shoot one. No, it wasn't a buck. You know, so I get two tags. So I want to hunt until December. You know, right. then at December time frame, then I'd go ahead and fill it with whatever come by, you know, because sure, sure. You can't eat tags. <laughs> I know. And I, you know, I, I I've seen a lot of stuff online lately. You're talking about how how much uh, you know, the the general media and things like that has re really uh pushed this idea and change expectations. I mean, social media has to of of what somebody should be shooting. And there's there's almost guilt and shame if you shoot something that you can't brag about uh you know or you feel like you couldn't brag about on social media but man you can't eat a tag and uh no <laughs> and i'm you know i might hold off for a little while but uh i'm i'm happy with anything that i'm you know uh, i'm gonna end up pulling trigger on i'm not i'm not sitting there ashamed of it yeah, and and you shouldn't be. You know, when I first started out, you know, I couldn't tell the difference between a fawn and an adult deer. I had no clue how to sure. even tell. You know, and yeah. it, I've shot some. It's like, oh, okay, you know, roll the donor, but it's a buck. I'm like, I didn't. I couldn't figure it out till one time I watched a hunting show, and they actually taught something. Yeah, you know, most oh. hunting <laughs> shows are just all about them shooting these great big bucks, uh, and, and most sure. of, most of the guys shooting their bows are shooting them incorrectly anyway. But yeah. that's another story and they said you know how do you tell an adult doe from a, a fawn you look at the tip of the nose the back of the head and the eye position if it's in the middle it's a fawn if it's longer from the eyes and nose and it's adult it's like yeah okay now i can tell that you know i can't tell my body size you know i hadn't shot enough deer to really know it's like okay this is a big one sure. a little one and you know it was me i didn't care <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely and you know if you've got a legal tag you take it with a legal means and uh and and, and it, you get out of it what you you know would like i mean go ahead and shoot it uh, uh we talk about it all the time with a, a myself between myself and a, and a group of friends about you know there is this this matter out there how do you get somebody into deer hunting right now who hasn't and all they see is the social media fodder of these big giant bucks and they walk out on public land or they walk out wherever for the very first time and they don't see anything like that i feel like that expectation is they failed somehow you know that right. they didn't see these these deer and so uh it'd be hard to hard to get started these days uh like that well a lot of those the the tv shows and stuff they have property that's managed fairly well oh yeah uh, they're they're not hunting where a thousand other people hunt you know they're right. not hunting a lot of public property and some do hunt public lands but most are sure. hunting on private property where the the herd is managed where you don't take the little bucks sure. um you, you you let the little bucks go and only take the mature bucks so now you have a bigger selection of nicer deer well right Right. Unless you want to pay for a lease that has that, most of right. us aren't going to afford to do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to hunt, I can hunt for free. You know, yeah. I'm going to go to a farmer <laughs> and, and, you know, try to eliminate some deer so they don't eat all their crops, you know, because the, right. the deer eat a lot of their crops. So, you know, yeah. I'm going to go out there. I really don't want to pay for a lease, um, you know, where you go in and you pay for all this, this stuff. You know, it'd be nice to have one. But you know, I'm I'm kind of a little bit cheap that way. Oh, <laughs> you know, I, I I get it, man. I, you know, I I have I have land um, one property. It's not real big, you know, it's along a creek, and there's a little bit of trees in there. And most of these crops about 80 acres, um, probably sure. about 75 of it's in in crop. Uh, then I have another one that is a little bit bigger property, but there's just a tree line edge in it. So it's not a great property, but there are deer on them. Yeah, sure. I'm just gonna figure out when they're coming. Nice about trail cameras, you can figure out. Okay, they're coming through at night. So, sure. uh, you know what? What time am I gonna go through? You know, where can I set up? And you know, Absolutely. they're coming through at night through here, right before hunting time. So if I set up here, then I got a chance of catching them after they've been into the field for a while. And sure, uh, you know, sure. You kind of figure out. That's nice about trail cameras is you can 
can kind of figure out where they're going instead of sitting there for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, yeah. last year uh, in, Fe in uh, February, what I would have seen my first year during the daylight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't hunt that time. So. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it is incredible. You know, I, I, I own, uh, you know, our house is on just five acres, but we, uh, we're kind of a uh, suburbia in this area. We get these deer that use our our backyard portion quite a bit, and uh, it almost time them sometimes. Uh, but uh, you know, they kind of get pushed around with the various random things that happen in a neighborhood. You know, right? And, uh, and but it's but it's interesting how, how even these small properties and stuff like that, the use of the trail cameras, and things can make a big difference, and whether you kind of burn your day or burn your time or uh maybe maybe it's worth investing you know we've got a we've got a couple of real nice suburban bucks that come through and they early season uh if i hadn't been on the road doing fishing tournaments i probably would have had a chance at a couple of them deer that uh had come through but uh now it's a matter of they're they're going on at night and and they may you know turn around here in the next uh two weeks or so yeah dur during the rut that kind of changes everything a little bit and everything yeah and you know it, so maybe that's the time but unfortunately here in nebraska the rifle hunters get the rut <laughs> yeah that's that's uh that's the, the the nice thing in wisconsin is that if you are a, an archery hunter uh as we get we, we get you know from middle of september until uh until basically the very beginning of january and in some places the end of january in the state of wisconsin to hunt with archery equipment and our uh, gun deer season begins uh, the week before Thanksgiving. And so we really get that that peak uh, chase phase and things like that with our archery equipment. And it's it's a lot of fun to be out in the woods at that time. Yeah, our our rifle is the, the second week in, in November is when it goes for 10 days. Um, you know, just one week back, you know, one week later makes a big sure. difference for archery. I know when I was yeah. at your check station that that one year that they moved it back a week and um or later in the year uh I'm, i was amazed at how many you know archers were bringing in big bucks that week before which it would have mm -hmm. been rifle season and, and rifle they check in you know i wasn't really checking in too many rifle um sure was, you know because i was archery i you know i had archery so a lot of archers would come into me but you know i was sure. at check station so they go but you know a lot of them are, you know, further out, you know, in the country, so they they don't really drive clear and down to check their deer in. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, I was I was actually just checking trail cameras from last year, uh, checking out when I had peak movement, uh, and it's funny to bring this up with that time frame, fourteenth through the nineteenth last year was was peak daytime camera activity, and uh, and for a lot of places including Michigan and Minnesota, that's really during their rifle season. Wisconsin, rarely do we start in that 16th, 17th, 18th range. It really depends on when Thanksgiving falls. And so we typically do get, uh, you know, that it's still quiet, it's still peaceful inside the woods uh, <laughs> at, uh, <laughs> at that peak range, you know. Yeah, that's it's nice. They, they've changed you know the the requirements around around here in in Nebraska September first to December thirty first is archery season, except during the nine days of rifle we have to wear orange, and then all of December is muzzleloader, but we don't have to wear sure. orange during muzzleloader season, but the muzzleloaders do. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> you, you know, yeah. it's it's I I don't know why, but that's just kind of the way it is, and you know yeah. it, it don't Wisconsin. hurt when you're out. No, yeah, it, uh, Wisconsin. We've got to wear orange anytime there's a uh, a, a gun deer season in our area. Uh, so, uh, you know, starting that weekend before Thanksgiving, you're probably in orange in most of the state until second weekend of December, uh, and then you can go back to all camouflage. Most of the gun deer seasons are over. Uh, some places have a a holiday hunt. If you're hunting in one of those counties, then uh, over the course of uh, the 24th through the first then you got to have that orange on too but um i really haven't seen it change much of of you know deer activity i think most hunters are pretty good about uh you know 
they're not up there in the tree waving their arms and stuff like that, uh, whether they're wearing blaze orange or camo. Yeah. Probably safer for everybody. Yeah. Well, and the deer don't see the orange anyway, so no, they're going to catch the movement whether you're wearing orange or full camo. And yeah, you know that. You know, if you had an orange camo, it's like okay, you know, you're you're hidden oh. from the deer, and everybody else can see you. And yeah, but, you know, generally yeah. for archery, it's it's fairly safe because you know more archers are hurt because of their own well. That's stupidity, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where you were going. I knew you were going there. Uh, yeah, I, I understand. I mean, hey, you know, we all get excited, right? We all we all get excited. We all are, uh, you know, ready to get going. And um, it's really easy to take a shortcut, do something that maybe uh, you weren't planning on doing or certainly weren't planning to, to handle if, if, the, if things happen. You know, as soon as archery season begins in that middle of September here, start seeing the Facebook posts and the report pages and things about, uh, you know, Hey, you know, don't be me. I stepped wrong off of my, you know, edge of my tree stand or up climbing up a ladder stand. And man, there's, there's, there's no reason for a lot of that, uh, with uh, great technologies and really affordability with a lot of the stuff, safety equipment wise, uh, really, uh, uh, all, all hunters should be, be wary of stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's getting in and out of your tree stands. That's that's the dangerous part, and that's the part mm-hmm. you really have to pay attention to, because it could easily, yeah. uh, you know, and and badly. And you know, I've I've been, you know, younger days, you know, here's this tree stand up here, and it's like, how do you get in here? Well, there was, you know, they'd cut the branches off, and you know how the tree will grow over it. Well, that was the yeah. knob you were trying to step on to get up yeah. in there. It's like. <laughs> like you want me to get in there on that it's like well okay but yeah you know now it's like nah i ain't getting in that tree stand <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I just started saddle hunting uh actually just started doing it last year and you know as far as safety wise that's 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 hard to beat you know is you're you're always attached to that tree somehow uh and and you know i, I even use the saddle setup when i'm when i'm setting tree stands in a, you know, on pub or a private land, uh, whether it's my, mine or, or a friend of ours, um, I'll use my saddle setup to do it just cause it's just, you feel so much more confident, uh, as long as your, as long as your equipment is up to par. Um, right. It really is a, it's a safe way to do it. Well, you're, you're strapped to the tree. You're not going to fall. Um, mm-hmm. you know, that's, yeah. that's the, the advantage of it. Um, you know, one thing that some people don't realize is, you know, you have your safety harness on, you know, it's wrapped around your legs and, and it's around your arms and your chest and everything. It's all, mm-hmm. so you're, you're nice and safe. But when you fall, you're, you're nice and safe. Well, yeah. there is a little strap that's on your, your safety harness. It has a little loop on the end of it. Yep. That is there so you don't die. Yeah, because what people don't realize is you can be hanging on there and you still die because it cuts off the circulation. Yeah. So that strap is there so you can push on it to release the pressure on you until you can get in there. So you don't have a long time. It keeps you from falling, hitting the ground, but you still got to have a plan on how I'm going to get back onto a safe place so I can get back down. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and that, that should be just as much of planning for a hunt. Uh, as anything else, you know, I mean, you, I, I do a lot of ice fishing and stuff like that too. And you, you just talk about some of the simple things like telling people where you're going, where you're going to be, right. you know, um, there's a lot of stories out there of people that have been hanging in a tree waiting for somebody to come and get them. You know, they, they right. fortunately did take the right steps, but couldn't quite get that toe over to that branch or to that ladder to, to right. get themselves <laughs> down. So, uh, or, you know, you find yourself in this kind of, precarious situation uh if you've got maybe a cell phone on you but in a in a pants pocket if you're hanging it's kind of hard to get to that type of stuff you've got to find a way to to get it you know i i do tend to put it up kind of in a breast pocket uh just so that i you know maybe stand a better chance of being able to grab it should i need it and if i'm being totally honest there are plenty of times where it's in my hand because i'm playing with it uh i'm sitting (laughs) in the tree stand these days but (laughs) Yeah, and then you fall, and then it's on the ground. So then it's on the ground, anyways. You're just looking at maybe an okay Google type thing, you know? (laughs) Yeah, 
I know when I set my tr my uh, uh, safety strap on onto the tree, I'll sit down on the platform and I'll set up height so I can feel it tugging on me when I'm sitting down. Sure. And then I stand up so that it, it doesn't tug on me, but I'm I'm so I'm standing and I can move a little bit. And I can actually lean forward and it'll keep me from falling off the tree stand. So mm -hmm. even if I was to step off the tree stand, I'm not going to go down much past my seat on the tree stand anyway. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And and okay, let's when I put my pegs in, I'm going to put pegs in so I the last one I step on. I step down to the tree stand and then I still have at least one or two more up there to put my hands on. So I step down to the tree stand. So, so now the, the scenario is the tree stand actually falls. You have no tree stand. It's on the ground and you're hanging there. Well, I have, because I can't fall down past my seat, I have my pegs of either right or left side that I can get to. And I, you know, you can kind of turn around and, and get to a peg and then, you know, work your way back down um so i set up so that even if my tree stand does leave the tree and i'm hanging there on the side of it i have a peg real close to me yeah now yeah. if i'm yeah. in a ladder stand and the ladder stand falls down yeah <laughs> it, now now you're in a little bit different procurement but then you can take um if you use like the lineman's line you know, and yep. you have the press, not that you keep pushing up as you're going yep. up. Well, if you have that there, you can hook onto that and you can put pressure on it and hold and drop it down. And then, you know, lean back. That's what you have pressure on it and hold up above it and slide it down. You know, so now you can descend that way. It's not optimal, but. Um, right. And, and none of that is going to be easy, right? Like that's no. all, I mean, <laughs> but it saved your life and that's what matters. Yeah, that's that's something you have to plan for, and mm. you know, don't don't dwell on it because if you keep thinking about it, you're probably going to make it happen. <laughs> um, yeah, you, yeah, you know, but it's like, okay, here's how I set up to prevent this, so I don't have, so I'm not worrying about the tree stand falling. I'm because well, for one, on a tree stand, if it's a strap on one, I'm putting at least two more ratchet straps on it because those mm -hmm. never get tight enough. So I'm going right. to put two more ratchet straps on it. And if I have one that chains on, I'm still going to put at least one more ratchet strap on because I don't want any movement in that tree stand. Yep. The only movement yep. I want is from the tree moving. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a tiny person. So, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm outfitting all of those stands and stuff like that with, with straps that I feel like are, are going to hold, you know, and <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, we've gone around and around it as a group of friends replacing a lot of the the straps on trees you know that have been there for a season a couple seasons you know we really visually inspect that type of stuff uh to make sure that things are safe and honestly i know things are rated a certain way you know go to you know pick your discount store or whatnot and pick up straps but uh, i'm really a, a big proponent of of getting a a real quality strap to strap those those things down down right. paying a little bit more for a quality strap uh uh and that won't be just in the material of the strap that'll be in the ratchet itself too uh, if anybody's hauled anything heavy on a trailer and ratcheted something down uh you will probably have come across a time where that strap you know those ratchets have not held uh you'll find that you got to tighten them up a few different times and that will happen over time even in a tree stand and i certainly don't want to be sitting in it when that happens so. <laughs> no <laughs> yeah that's why you, you really shouldn't leave your tree stands you know there over the the summertime because the tree grows so much and put a lot of pressure sure. on the strap and um i know we've had some tree stands in and when we lost access to the property i'm taking the pegs out and now one of them actually broke it's like okay it, it had rusted it inside it just broke i couldn't crank it out because it just broke off sure it's like, yeah, it, yeah, you know, it was in there a ways, but still. <laughs> oh, yeah, it happens. Know, and... We, like I said, I, I started saddle hunting last year, and that, I really enjoyed that uh, that aspect of it, uh, being strapped to the tree uh, at all times. I do use a small standing platform. Um, that, I mean, I I will cinch that sucker tight, and and, and 
make sure things are, are, are good to go there before I step down onto it. And mm-hmm. same thing, as you said, you know, you, you take that platform and that's set below the top of your sticks that you're able to step down onto it. I don't know how many different setups I see, you know, pictures or, or something where they've got that tree stand above their last step and you're asking for trouble for a lot of right. different reasons right there. Yeah. That's, you know, you have to climb up it onto your tree stand and that that's never a good thing because you can, if you're above it now, then, you know, you can, while you're strapped to the tree, cause you really should be strapped to trees as you're climbing. Mm-hmm. Um, the ladder stand is a little bit more difficult, but they're a little bit safer, but sure. Um, not, not a whole lot, but a little bit more, you know, the lifelines are, are big. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the lifelines are a little bit more them. difficult yeah. on, on those. Cause you're quite a ways away from the tree. If you do it, you're going to be swinging into the tree uh, sure. to get up a little bit higher. <laughs> but uh, um, you know, if you're using pegs or, or, you know, climbing up on the side of the tree, you know, put one of the lifelines on it. And, and as you move up a little bit, um, you know, move it higher until once you get up in, in a tree stand then leave it up higher. And when you come down, just go ahead and keep sliding the knot down, you know, so it's above you. So if you fall, it's not, mm-hmm. it's going to lock pretty close. If you're down below, you got to lock yep. away for a dog and just keep, as you're climbing down, just, just reach up and, you know, you got both feet in one hand, slide it down and move down and slide it down and until you're down at the bottom and unhook from it. When you get ready to go in, hook back up to it. And, and, and as you're going, slide it up as high as you can climb up and slide and, you know, if anything happens, you know, you're hanging on the side of the tree and, and you're, and you're, yeah. you're safe because you've got pegs that you grab onto, you know, if you miss yeah. a peg or, or one breaks, uh, um, you know, more likely you miss a peg, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, cause you're climbing up and then, and it, I've seen people put steps so far apart, you're actually <laughs> climbing up to the next step. Uh, and, well, and that's hard on, on, old guy's knees <laughs> yeah but yeah you know a normal step is seven to eight inches yep so between one peg and the next one up you should have 14 to 16 inches is the most you should have because that's mm-hmm. a normal step going up and you know i kind of use my arm as you know from one peg over i kind of do and then here's the peg and then you know i kind of use that as a you know as a guy that gets me pretty close so it makes sure. it tougher to climb up winter term we put our our big heavy coats on our parkas and bibs on the ground and now we get to climb up sure you're not yep. flexible you got all the no. bulk on you so <laughs> yeah closer together more steps it's a whole lot more work putting in but yeah you know yeah uh, i got a thing that um i got a mirror set makes a, a little handle thing you can use for cranking them in and i used sure. to take a battery powered drill and i'd pre-drill the holes oh yeah pre-drill the holes just make sure it's you know smaller than the main part meaty part of the, the shaft inside yeah the shaft. absolutely so you can screw it in and, and it screws in a lot easier it's going to be just as tight you know as as something where you're trying to force it in in fact it probably sure. makes better threads um yeah and then crank them in and then climb up and uh you know that's how i used to put in a lot of pegs and and now i use a little more ladder stands but sure uh, you know because they're a little i don't have to work so hard to get steps in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i get it i get it yeah we you know we used a lot of ladder stands uh we had a, a piece of property that we hunted uh it was a family farm that we hunted for many years we used a lot of ladder stands and but we we adapted from different things too we had everything from pegs and hang-on stands to uh ladder stands to uh uh, uh, uh you know large uh fancy uh, blinds you know that we you know the, the taj mahal type of type yeah. of places with a deck a heater <laughs> deck and the whole the whole nine yards you know it's uh you take some of those uh calendars of deer blinds of the uh of the north woods type things and it would it would be a pretty good submission some of those some of those we had there <laughs> yeah well and, and those are good for rifle because you know you don't have to get so close um absolutely yeah and they're they're you know comfortability and stuff like that you know you, you do have to think about things not only safety wise and stuff uh with the rifle and and the archery stuff in some of these stands there's th- there's each one of them that you get into there's a little different element you got to worry about yeah yeah sometimes you get tree stands that are just a perfect setup on I, I know one time i set up on a tree stand and one branch going oh just perfect i had just a slight little lean back 
And it's like, okay, I'm back in my easy chair. I can set my arm up on the chair on the side of it, you know, take a nap. <laughs> you know, it was absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, you feel sick because you're leaning back, you're not leaning forward. And besides, you're strapped in really good. So, you know, there's always times when you kind of doze off a little bit because, you know, we're up there bright and early and just comfortable, time, right? Yeah. <laughs> I remember the time I was in a blind as turkey hunting and it was getting close to about time we're getting ready to go and hadn't seen any turkeys come by and, and didn't hurt anything. And I'm kind of dozing off and all of a sudden had a plastic decoy out there. All of a sudden, something smacked that decoy. I opened my eyes. A coyote attacked the turkey decoy. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw, oh, man, I could have shot a coyote I, I, if I hadn't fallen asleep. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. That's crazy. And those are awesome stories, though, too. I, I, I just think of so many different times I've been able to get out in the woods. And, and what archery hunting has really allowed me to do is spend that much more time uh, out in the woods. You know, I, I, I my first bits of hunting as i mentioned at the very beginning with my dad taking so much time off to raise kids i i wasn't i wasn't really brought up in a in a in a world where i'd go out and small game hunt or anything like that my first really introduction was what is rifle hunting deer and uh uh you know that that's such a small portion of wisconsin i mean the rifle hunts in nine days here in the state of wisconsin we've added a few different seasons since i was you know 11 and 12 years old but um the archery world has just given me so many more days, so many more times uh, in the in the woods, and uh, to observe, you know, this this great creation we have to uh, to sit in, and and I think it's 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 cool to be able to bring my son along in that journey, and um, it's just been an awesome awesome opportunity to have that uh, that chance. Yeah, it is when you can take your kids out in the uh, um, forest with you. That that space nice. You know, when I had yeah. my son out in the tree, I set a tree stand for me. I set a tree stand right so he climb up and climb over. And, and, you know, he had all the covered up. You couldn't really see anything. It was just so camoed up there. You couldn't really see anything. And, you know, that's when I give him the uh, uh, the call is, is here, you call. You, you, yeah. you can't mess it up. <laughs> you know, if they're coming in, you know, just don't do anything if they're coming in. Uh, yeah. Let them come. But, you know, if they hear it, they're really going to ignore it, come to it, or go away. Yeah. And yeah. we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And the wor worst case scenario goes away, but you, you, you didn't really ruin anything. You didn't wreck, uh, you know, you didn't wreck an opportunity. The chances are it wasn't coming your way anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I've had, had time when uh, I seen this, this little buck and he was kind of walking down this trail away from me and he got down a little ways. And I, I, I forget which call he used. I think he'd grunt. And then I heard him turn and turn to the right and start walking. And I did a little bit more and I heard him turn and I got him all the way on the other side of me. You know, I, I couldn't shoot over there, but yeah. I got him turned around and it wasn't too much later. Here comes the big buck down the trail that I couldn't shoot on. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, it's, I, it's... I was playing with the one and, and another one come in. I was like, oh, you come in where I can't shoot you. Cause I, I don't have any shooting lanes over there. It's, you know, my right hand side, I've, right sure, so I, sure. it, it's hard to shoot them right-handed shots yeah um, absolutely it is you know so i didn't set up really i didn't clear anything because to get turned around and take that kind of shot was just not very conducive to doing it so yeah, i didn't bother clearing yeah. a lane for something i couldn't really shoot anyway and it comes yeah. down as like oh man. <laughs> <laughs> no i get it i get it no I, I i really like i said i've enjoyed the the time archery hunting I mean, obviously in the state of Wisconsin, it gives you just that, that chance to be in that, that peak, you know, chase phase and, and experience the rut and really better weather and stuff like that too, uh, than, than we typically get for a uh, gun deer season and stuff like that. And, um, I'm so, I'm so grateful for the opportunities that I've had working in, in the archery shops to just kind of pick up on some, uh, on things that, that others have made into bad habits and, and not <laughs> make those same mistakes. And, uh, uh, and, and honestly, one of the coolest parts about working in the archery shop was, um, helping people get into involved in it for the very first time was, was watching them, you know, walk through and, and, you know, maybe they did see something online that spurred their interest or whatnot. And, and watching, you know, some of these aha moments, whether it be with kids or, uh, with women that would come in, um, 
and uh and even and even you know young men that w- would come in that hadn't done it uh before uh and, and and give themselves that opportunity to enjoy uh the woods a little bit more often than than just taking the rifle out yeah it does allow you to have a lot more time in in the the forest and in the woods um one of the things that us archers get to see that the rifle hunters don't normally get to see is because we're camoed up we're, we're sitting still um you know animals just either landing on you or walking by or can't figure yeah. out what you are uh you know we get to see a lot of that that stuff in there that you don't really see if you're not a bow hunter because you don't yeah. you aren't sitting in a tree just kind of observing everything you, yeah. you know you're, you're kind of, you're, well we're, we're snipers basically because yeah. yeah we're we're hiding in a roost and and a target comes by and we shoot it you know that's, right. that's what a sniper <laughs> does you know yeah <laughs> you know yeah. You know, we're Absolutely. not spotting in stock and some do spot in stock, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit, uh, I don't think majority do that. There's some right. that do and do it very well. And, um, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's a different challenge, Yeah, you know, to, yeah. to spot them and stock them. And, you know, right here for the white tails, they're kind of predictable. Uh, so sure. it's not there, but if we go out in Western Nebraska where the muleys are at, yeah, you're not going to sit and wait for them. You might wait a month for them to come walking by where you're at. <laughs> yeah, hard you to know. ambush them that way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're 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 not very uh, patternable. <laughs> yeah, you know, like yeah, like the white tails. So you got like, oh, there's one. It's like, okay, which way is it going? Can we head it off? You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe for we can sure. get in the car and drive over there to head it off. You know, right, and, and then right. walk the rest of the way. Right. Yep. No doubt. Yeah, that's a uh, completely different animal to hunt. You know, and then oh, they got sure. the, the seek of deer, and then there are all kinds of, of different deer. And, you know, they're all hunting a little different. You know, down south, they, they hunt them differently than we do up here at north. And, uh, you know, they have warmer weather. So, uh, you know, you have to consider that, you know, up here during early season, September, um, and actually most of October, it's been really warm. So yeah. you don't really want to do an afternoon hunt if you get one, you got to find yeah. it because it's, it's yeah. hot. Um, yeah. Yeah. you know, Monday it was in the eighties and it's supposed to be, you know, this Saturday they're predicting snow. Uh, yep. <laughs> so, uh, you, you never know. And, you know, if you go to morning hunt, you at least you have daylight to find it, Yeah. but you still don't have a lot of time. If you don't make a good hit and don't find it right away, it's going to be bad. Yeah. Uh, it's well on you. So, um, that's what nice about a little bit colder weather, you know, like you get up there and we get here is, you know, during, during the later season is if you sure. don't find it, you can at least come back the next morning Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's, it's going to still be good because it was cold enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're headed into that time frame here in Wisconsin. Uh, yeah, this weekend looks like a really good, uh, weekend to, uh, to hunt. I was, uh, texting with a buddy of mine. I circle the 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 forecast uh from friday to saturday and i said whoa man a lot a lot of deer are gonna die on saturday because i think we got a high of 61 on friday and a high of like 37 on saturday so oh yeah um, it's uh and, and in fact that it's saturday you're just gonna have naturally have a number of uh more people out in the woods and it's gonna be an interesting uh interesting time and uh, really, it's going to be a nice a nice change of pace for October because it's it's been relatively mild. Yeah, it's, it starts getting a little little rainy and snowy, and it's like that's when you get excited about being out in the woods because you know the deer are going to be moving and and you know trying to get some food and, and you just got to hope that you know where you're at they're coming through during the daylight. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then chances are a big front like that they'll be on their feet. Uh, you know through most of the Midwest, I'd really recommend watching that weather forecast this week. And if you got a chance to get out in the woods, man, get on that backside of that front and, uh, and hunt away. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a good plan. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So what, what's, what's been kind of your most memorable hunt you've been on? Most memorable, you know, I was probably talking about it just the other day. I, I wish I could tell you it was an archery hunt, but it, it, it was a gun deer season hunt. It was the very last hunt with my grandfather. Um, it was, uh, it was an arch or it was an antlerless only hunt 
uh, my grandfather had been going through about a year and a half, almost two years worth of, uh, of, uh, chemotherapy at that point for stomach cancer. Um, and, uh, in his, in his eighties, just, uh, he was 81 at the time. And, uh, he would not give up. I had told him multiple times, you do not have to sit out here, grandpa. You know, like I will, I'll just call you. I know how to operate the tractor. You don't have to come down and pick up any deer or anything like that. And he just would not, uh, he would not sit, uh, uh, sit out on that one. And I remember I, I, I had a really good night. I had shot four deer that night and, and mi- missed on a fifth. And, um, uh, he came down and I remember him just being so excited. I mean, I, I, I've, I've shot a lot of deer in that, uh, in that property. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, you know, 200 inch deer party, or anything like that. It was, these are just a bunch of, bunch of does. But I remember him being so, so excited and could not wait to get, jump on that tractor and, and drive it down and, and help pick up these deer. And I just will not forget, you know, I could tell he's just freezing, but he was so happy to be a part of that. Cause I think he knew that was going to be his last time to be able to hunt. Uh, I, of course, didn't necessarily foresee it as much. I was really hoping to be able to get a chance to, you know, another season with him, but I think he, he kind of saw that writing on that wall and he, 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 uh, that was, uh, that was in December of 2019. He passed in August of 2020. So just before we got back into another archery season hunt, but there was, there was another, uh, really memorable moment, uh, for me and, and my grandfather was again on that same property opening day of archery season um i was sitting in uh in, in a stand where i was watching over a water hole and uh had some some young bucks come out some little four corns come out and and uh they were sparring uh when they met each other at the water hole it was a really really neat thing to just watch it was one of the first times i i had seen as much of that activity as i had and uh this was you know mid-september in wisconsin and uh uh, when those bucks had left, uh, I kind of just thought, you know, the night was, was going to calm down. Wasn't going to get much more activity, a real nice, uh, wide deer came out. I, I didn't know what he was points wise. He was just so wide. Ultimately ended up being a six pointer. He had never grown brow tines. He just got oh. wide and, and tall. And, uh, uh, I shot him. And after I shot him, uh, there was probably 20, 25 minutes left of daylight. I shot him. He runs off and back into our swamp. And within two, three minutes, I see my grandpa walking towards me. And I thought, well, how did he know I shot? I know we were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yards away from each other. And how did he get down so fast? <laughs> like, I, you know, there's no reason <laughs> for him to get down. We still got 20 minutes, you know, what would and uh, so I start climbing down and I, I meet him down below my stand. And I was like, uh, I, I, he, he went in, you know, I just started telling him about my hunt. I said, he went in right there by the, you know, by, by the pond. And, and he goes, oh, you got one too? I was like, oh, you got one? He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never for a minute thought he got down because he shot a deer. Uh, <laughs> he ended up actually shooting uh, a spike in velvet. Um, and uh He's like, you know, I only shot it because I'd never seen a deer in velvet while I was sitting out in the woods. And, and, you know, he's at this time, he's probably 75 years old. So however many seasons that is that he's had the chance to be out there, uh, never seen a velvet, uh, a velvet buck while out hunting. So he saw it, he wanted to harvest it. He made a great shot on it. And, uh, so that night we both tagged out on opening day. And, uh, now that he's passed, uh, that buck, actually my aunt uh, decided as a gift to him, she was going to have it mounted. And so I have that shoulder mount and I have my mount from the big wide six pointer next to each other, uh, at my house. And so, uh, that, that reminds me every, you know, every time I get a chance to take a look at that with some, some good memories with my grandpa and he's the one who I did most of my archery hunting with. Uh, in fact, this, this upcoming weekend would have normally been a weekend. I would head to his place and, and we would get out and hunt together and He'd have a, a small window because uh, this was uh, anniversary weekend and uh, <laughs> with, with my grandma. And so he had to be back at certain times. There were certain parameters that, that he had to uh, adhere to, but he was allowed to, 
allowed to hunt uh, th- this uh, this coming weekend. So great memories like that and uh, stuff I, I certainly won't ever forget. Yeah, that's an amazing story and a memory that will stick with you for a long time. And, sure, you know, those that, that's that's kind of the stories that, you know, we like to hear. And and it's so exciting, you know, that you was able to do that and uh, to yeah. spend that time with him. And, you yep. know, that's that, that's it's amazing that you were able to spend that last hunt. And it was such a great hunt with him. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a real neat moment. And uh I don't think my grandma was real happy that he decided to come out and, you know, drive the tractor down or whatnot, because it took him a long time to warm back up that night. But, uh, oh. <laughs> but it was it was fun. It was fun to have him there. Yeah, it was worth it to him. <laughs> Absolutely it was. Absolutely yeah. it was. Well, follow up with that. It's like you say they even ask, what's the most challenging hunt you've been on? Oof. You know, uh I, I did a uh, I went elk hunting out in Colorado uh, back in, in 2019 as well. And uh, it's the first time that I've done a, a Western hunt, uh, went out to the White River National Forest. And, and really, it was just a, a, just a wild experience compared to hunting the woodlands of Wisconsin. Um, just so many different aspects of hunting elk versus whitetail. Uh, it was a rifle hunt. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, during most of the archery seasons out there, I'm still running fishing tournaments, and so it's it's hard <laughs> to hard to draw those tags. But uh, but going out there and just you know battling uh, uh, battling your the elements of altitude, uh, weather constantly changing, winds constantly changing, and then you know you've you got plenty of of uh, public pressure. Uh, that time of year it was about about this time of, of year that I left for that hunt. So that's third rifle season in Colorado. Um, so, you know, those deer have kind of been, or those elk rather have been kind of pushed around uh, quite a bit at that time. And, you know, I, I, I had a cow tag in my pocket. I did end up taking, uh, taking a cow, uh, but it, it, it felt like probably the most exhaustive uh, hunt in those number of days as I've ever had anywhere, because you're just, you're on your feet all the time. Uh, you're, you're out there trying to learn something so foreign compared to hunting whitetails uh, over, you know, farmland or even, even big timber, but whitetails, it's just so much different. I learned a lot. I really would like to get back out there and do that again. Um, but, uh, but I would, I would have to rank that as certainly one of my, one of my most challenging. Yeah, that would be challenging running up and down the mountains, especially when you're not used to it. And yeah, I know when I was a kid, we used to go to mountains all the time, but yeah, you know, now I'm I'm not sure I want to try it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. There's nowhere to, it's hard to practice that type of stuff in Wisconsin. Right. You know, there's uh I've done a lot of uh I've done some international fishing competitions and you just you find yourself in places doing things that you you can't practice, you know, you no right. way of putting that into motion and kind of learn on the fly that's it's nice when you go someplace like that to have somebody that's yeah. been there and done that and you know that's when it's worth getting a guide to at least get you onto the place for help sure. you for sure from not getting yeah. lost and and keep on on track and learn Absolutely. what they're doing and you know have a, a live trail camera basically <laughs> right yep absolutely yeah that's that that's that would be a, a challenge for sure, you know, getting out there and climbing up and down the mountains. And yeah, you know, it's, it's hard enough to go up and down the hills that we have around here. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> they, they can be pretty steep. We've got some that's pretty steep around here too, that we have to go up and down once in a while. And fortunately where I'm, I'm hunting in the place I'm hunting, I, I can basically drive the four wheeler to where I'm hunting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, that was, what, that was what was nice. Uh, at one point on the family farm, being able to do that and, a little bit different in some of the places that we go now. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's kind of nice to be able to take a four wheeler and, and, you know, bring your stuff there and, and you don't have to worry, you know, park it a ways away and then walk down to your stand. So at least it's not parked where you're at. And Sure. Yep. For they, sure. You know, they, they get used to stuff being in fields anyway. You know, I, Absolutely. I, I, 
one time where I parked my car by by a pond and we're hunting outside the tracks and I'm sitting in my tree and I can see my truck, the deer walking right behind my truck. Sure. They didn't care. They didn't care. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's amazing what deer will do. Yeah. Even in, in cities too, you know, they'll be running around and, and, you know, once like you'll catch them, you know, in, in, your, in your backyard in some places. Yeah. Now For here, sure. I haven't caught it here, but we got a lot of fields around us. So, they're not going to really sure. come into town. There's too many fields. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good deal. Yeah. Whenever I leave, no matter which direction I go, I got to drive by fields, <laughs> corn fields or bean fields. <laughs> sure, sure. Can't even get well, out of the village. <laughs> a lot of standing, uh, a lot of standing, old, old standing timber from uh, paper mills and stuff like that right around by me. And so uh, a lot of pines and things like that. And uh, uh, black and, and, uh, red oak trees and, uh, bur oaks and stuff like that, that we, uh, we hunt around here. Nice trees to hunt in. The yeah, absolutely. Quite, I mean, pine's not quite so much, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of cover in some of those, but, uh, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of white pines, a lot of red pines and stuff like that. They kind of grow up and, and get a little, uh, a little less, uh, crowded in that, that lower third of the tree. But, uh, um, but a lot of a lot of good oaks and yeah, you know, I'd love to have some white oak trees around here. But uh, the deer will still eat all the acorns out of those black and red oaks. So uh, when uh, when there's nothing left to eat, anyways. Yeah, I know. I said one tree stand and there's a a, um, a pine tree, you know, that I could kind of reach. Every time I get in, I'd, I'd grab a couple branches, you know, a couple of leaves, and just kind of rub it in my fingers a little bit, and you, you know, <laughs> a little, little cover of natu natural scent because it's tree it's naturally yeah. there and. And you know, a sure. little bit extra cover, and besides, it kind of smelled yeah. good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Smell the pine sure. instead of the dirt. Sure. That's right. That's right. So, what um, you you do a lot of fishing tournaments? Then you know, tell us about some of those because I'm sure a lot of my <laughs> listeners also fish. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, no. I so I'm the I'm the tournament director for the Masters Walleye Circuit National Walleye Tour. Uh, that's you know, kind of the two primary um, uh, tournament series that I, that I operate, uh, or that I, that I help facilitate. And so, uh, you know, the master's walleye circuit has been around since 1984. Uh, it's a two person team tournament. We go everywhere from Colorado to New York running events, uh, all depends on the seasons and the years that, uh, that we put together a schedule It starts in March every year, goes till October every year, or just about October every year. And, uh, and the national walleye tour, it's a pro co event. Uh, so, you know, you've got your pro level uh, $1,700 uh, uh, entry fee and your uh, co-angler or, or amateur angler level at $500 entry fee. And uh, you guys fish together uh, during, uh, during the two-day event. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's $100,000, you know, basically to win an uh, event on that National Walleye Tour and the Masters Walleye Circuit. It, uh, it varies widely depending on, on um, how many teams are in it. But uh, typically, we're doing ten thousand dollars or more to win on on the uh, Masters Wally Circuit side. Uh, we get a chance to see a lot of great uh, bodies of water. Obviously, you know, making stops at Lake Erie and the Bay of Green Bay and Mississippi River and Lake Oahe, things like that. Uh, but we've been out to uh, uh, Ogallala and, and Lake McConaughey in, in years past uh, in Nebraska. Um, not a lot of water sitting in that body of water right now, uh, so uh, <laughs> no. I'd like to see. It. A little bit more, uh, a little bit more snowfall up in the mountains, and uh, get a little bit more water traveling through uh, that whole that whole area would be nice, uh, both uh, in that lower section of of the Midwest and and then uh, even Oahe and the Missouri River system is uh, is pretty pretty low right now. Really need yeah, it is some good snowfalls to to help uh, alleviate that. Yeah, we can definitely use some some water around here it's it's getting kind of dried up and some of the lakes are just even some of the little smaller lakes you can definitely tell that their water levels are pretty low for um, sure for sure we do have one lake they put in not too long ago that it's up the capacity because they, they keep it at capacity and only if it flows over does do they let it down so um, sure. it's pretty pretty much this level it's going to be and as long as there's water feeding it then it's going to stay at that level because there's really no gates that i can i can tell that it'll let out even more water so it's right right it, it's definitely not for flood control <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it won't control anything <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, uh, kind of interesting to us. I when I had my uh, store um, first year, we run a, a bass tournament and didn't really. I, I didn't do it more than one year because the guy that had it before me didn't kind of run it down and you know not run it very well, so didn't have much participation sure. and. And I was like, okay, this is too much work for what I'm getting out of it. You know, I'm not getting much <laughs> out of it. And, and, sure. and you know, the uh, the people would come in in the tournament, they would come in and, and they'd pay for the tournament and leave and never buy anything. They didn't buy any supplies from me. Sure. You know, and I had, sure. I had, you know, bait and tackle and archery and everything. So they weren't even buying any parts from me, you know, for their, sure. their jigs and stuff. So they're like, yeah. okay, this is not getting a return on anything. And, you know, I just didn't want to put the work into you know, make it into something really big and, you know, right, already, right. it was bigger, you know, it used to be quite a bit bigger than, you know, the guy before, you know, he'd show up late and, you know, just sure. And people quit going to those kind of tournaments and it's like, okay, yeah, I, I don't have time for this. <laughs> so <laughs> That's I a, it's it. a lot. I, I had to do it the first year because he had already had it set up. Sure. You sure. Know, so yeah. I had to go do them and we're driving around and do all these and, and, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting, but, you know, for the amount of driving I was doing and, time was gone yeah, yeah it wasn't worth my time but yeah yeah it can be a lot of uh, it can be a challenge for for one-off events like that uh you know when we do it every every weekend it's you know uh, for us it almost seems second nature at that point but yeah if one-off events i don't know how how some of those folks do it because it ends up being uh time consuming all consuming really uh, yeah when it comes to getting that stuff together you and, know we, we had i think we had four or five different events was scheduled for that year and sure you know it's it's one of those things that you know it, if i really wanted to really go with it i i could have you know started doing stuff to make it get a little bit better and you know getting surprises sure. and and stuff like that but you, you know the, at that point you know it wasn't it wasn't paying so um, yeah yeah, me, I'd rather go catfishing than bass fishing anyway. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. I was, you know, I, I was more interested in catfishing than I was in, in bass fishing, and you know, here we're, we're running bass tournaments, and <laughs> so me and buddy of mine that, that worked for me at the story is one of my shooters. Uh, you know, we'd go around and and, and run some leases. Was there, and then while they're out, we'd go, you know, fishing for catfish or something. And we wouldn't fish for bass because they were fishing for bass, but. We'd go out catfishing sure. while we're doing it, and then we'd come back, and you know, absolutely, he was the bass fishing, I was the catfishing. And so we'd go out catch, go for catfish, and and I'm catching them all, and he's not catching anything. I was like, sure. oh, Randy, <laughs> you got to throw your hook in the crap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. the 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 master, you know, bounce it off a tree, let it drop down, and absolutely, and, you know, that's where the cats are at. You know, not where the bass are at. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's so. Right. Uh, but going out bass fishing, you know, he'd catch them all day. And I was like, I wouldn't catch any because. <laughs> sure, sure, for sure. Yeah, it's it, it just what you used to. And, you know, I like to use liver for catfishing and it's and just a, a single hook. You sure. know, you got the, yeah. the triple hooks and they got the liver hooks that, you know, have a couple of things and you fold them over. No, it's, it's real easy. I can cast that liver a long ways, you know, because yeah. you hook it and twist it, hook it, twist, hook and twist. The memory's in there. Yeah. Find it. You just don't use a lot of wrist action when you throw it, you know, the whole yeah, arm, like, yeah. you know, it, it's like a yeah. tennis racket, not a, a racquetball racket. You know, you don't use That's wrist right. <laughs> so you cast it out there and, and nice of that is that you just sit there, cast it out there. And it's like, sit back and wait. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, you can relax. Absolutely. It may, Absolutely. Kind of like archery, you know, you, you, you right. <laughs> get up there and get ready. You get your bow ready. You sit there and you wait. Hurry up <laughs> and, and wait. Then you Absolutely. shoot and go. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's uh, that, that that's kind of fun. Just being outside doing doing stuff like that is is a lot of absolutely. fun. Absolutely. So, um, what would you like to tell our audience? If you give them a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of wisdom. You know, uh, there was a really great angler that fished in both the uh, Masters Walleye Circuit, the National Walleye Tour, and actually he did a lot of crappie tournaments as well. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, there, there's, there are some people that you would, you know, absolutely look up to uh, as, 
you know, a, a pillar in the community, pillar in a in an organization, and uh, he ended up uh, he ended up also enjoying archery hunting, uh, doing stuff like that, and he fell out of a tree, and he used his platform on the fishing tournaments uh, until he uh, until he died of cancer to just continue to preach safety. We all are so excited about being able to get out and do different things and have all these great hobbies and, you know, the, the, the technologies out there to be able to do some amazing stuff. And the one thing so many people ignore is safety. Like we talked about earlier, the lifelines, the, the checking your stuff. I mean, so a bow doesn't blow up on you, you know, your, whether it's your string or cams or, or, or limbs or any of it. You know, you gotta, gotta, you gotta be safe about it. Um, check your stuff the next time you get, you know, before you go out, you know, and, uh, and make sure you got a plan and, and uh, you, you can enjoy everything multiple times, uh, as long as you're able to come back each and every time. That That's a good point. This safety, 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 and yeah. And, 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 you know, you, you got to be aware of what's out there, too. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, happens a lot is you it's starting to get light. And it's like, OK, that looks like a deer. That's a deer. That's a deer. Mm. No, that's a tree. But that's a branch. Yeah. 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 You know, or, or, you know, going the other way, it's like, OK, now I know that was a tree, but it sure looks like a deer. And, yeah. and then and then, too, you know, you got to make sure of your target when you shoot. Um, here many years ago, we had a guy that got shot with an arrow and <laughs> unreal. And, and in the store, the guy that got shot come in the store and a guy that shot him both had come into my store. So I got to hear both sides of the story, wow. you know, and, and it was, it was a new archer. He didn't really realize that, you know, you've got to, that ha things happen. And it was it, the, the guy was walking out, not after shooting time, but right at that last little bit of shooting time. Sure. And and the guy that shot him thought it was a deer, but he didn't completely one hundred percent identify that it was a deer. And he shot and he hit him. And you know the, yeah. you know, the guy has a, has a little limp, you know, because mm. you know, where he got shot, you know, and sure. Um, and and I forget in the lower one of the lower extremities someplace, but sure. Uh, um, you know, I, I know what happened by by what he was the, they were saying. It's like he 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 heard it coming. He thought it was a deer. It looked like it could have been a deer, but it's sure. that your trees turn into deer at that dusk and dawn. Yeah. yeah. You know what you think is a deer is is actually not a deer. And it's like you got to be 100% sure of what your target is and what's behind your target. Yeah. You, you know, yeah, absolutely do. You know, if you have a doe come walking in and there's a fawn on the other side and you don't see the fawn and yeah. you get a tag for one deer and you shoot that doe and it also kills the fawn, you just, you just killed, illegally killed a deer. Yeah. Because you got both yeah. of them. Yeah. You know, you know, will the game warden, you know, touch <laughs> your break? Might, might not, but yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's your job to identify what's yeah. what's past there. Um yeah. you know, same thing when you're rifle hunting, you know. I had one Absolutely. time it's like here's this deer, it was at the crest of the hill, and it's like I can't shoot it. Sure. sure. It's within range. But yeah. that bullet is going to go through that deer and land somewhere on the other side that I can't control. So yeah. I had to pass, you know, because I could shoot. Now, if it had been down a little bit, so it would have gone through the, into the ground, that'd be a different story. You know, and, and the same thing, you know, with Archie, you got to make sure what's on the other side. You know, if you have two standing side by side, you got to wait till they separate because you yeah. can't take a chance of hitting two. Now, if you have a tag for, for two deer, Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Except yeah, the second absolutely. one, you know, if you're in a tree stand, you're not going to normally get the second one. But if you're on the ground, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can shoot straight, you know. Yeah. Still, it's, yeah. you know, like I said, you know, you, you got to be safe and go from there. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. 
No, that's yeah. that's what I can leave you with. Uh, the, by the way, the gentleman's name, Tommy Scarless, was the one. Uh, and, and some people know him from hunting. Some people know him from fishing. Uh, but he he's the one who really instilled in me we got to be safe about these things uh things can, right. life can change in a heartbeat you know so yeah yeah it can well it's been great talking with you um i'm i'm sure others have enjoyed the stories i know i enjoyed the stories and and you know we'll just have to talk a little bit later and uh, remember you can um uh, watch this on my podcast on learn to fix it yourself now uh, you can listen to it on audible uh, as well as on Spotify and other places to get them. So there's always uh, some way to listen to it or watch it. Now, I kind of like watching them because it's, you know, you get to see everybody and talk to them. And but it's been really great having you on. I appreciate it, Roy. I really do. Uh, I hope uh, folks get out and, and enjoy it. And as I mentioned, you know, looking at the, the calendar, looking at that weather, if you're in the Midwest uh, this week, boy, I'd look at getting in a tree stand here <laughs> in the next <laughs> few days. Uh, no doubt about it. going to be a good yeah. one. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on. My name is Rory Canterbury. I've been hosting on Archstock 101, and we'll see you on the next one.